Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read a couple verses here, starting verse 7. And the title of the message today is Sowing the Kingdom. Not stitch sowing the kingdom, but sowing like seed the kingdom. Sowing the kingdom. Galatians 6, verse 7. It says, do not be con- deceived. God is not mocked for whatever. Say whatever. The King James says, whatsoever a man sows, that will he reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. You notice how we're talking about sowing, and then he just changes his verbiage and goes, doing good, right? Like this is the command to sow. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap. Not we might reap, we shall reap if, here's the prerequisite, we do not lose heart. So you want to reap? Faith and patience. We learned that last week. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that your word not just the written word, or not just a word that goes into the ears of every person, but your revealed word would go into every heart today, Lord. Lord, that you would begin to rearrange us on the inside, that you would begin to cut away and do surgery in our lives of the attitudes or the outlooks or the ways of thinking, Lord, that are a block or that are hindering what you want to do. Lord, if any area of our lives are grieving you, Holy Spirit, reveal them to us, shed light on those areas, Lord. We humble ourselves, Lord, and we say whatever it takes, God, Lord, whatever needs to happen for us to be positioned to be vessels of honor, of gold, Lord, Lord, eternal vessels to accomplish your purpose in this short time we're on this earth. Lord, we want to do it. We say yes, and we surrender to it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen, amen. Okay, so in Galatians 6, we just learned something real important here. Now, we can gloss over it, but I want to hit you with three uh, points that clarify what I'm going to try to get across today. I'm going to read it slowly again, and let's see if we can see what God's wanting us to know. Verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever, or the King James says, whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. Okay, are you ready for this? Whatsoever someone sows. That means all things can be seeds. All things. He didn't say only certain things. He says, whatever you sow. That means good and bad. All things can take on the form of seed in our life. Then he goes on to say, for he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will reap of uh, everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. So we learn all things can be seeds. We also learn that all people, say all people, because in, in Greek, this, I want to be clear. This doesn't just mean men when you see men. I know that that might be elementary to some, but I want to clarify. This means all, okay? When I say mankind, I mean all humans, okay? So if you're human, this is for you, okay? So all things can be seed, and here we go. All people are farmers, all people. So you are a farmer whether you like it or not. What's that song? Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, right? All of us just hit me while I was preaching. I didn't even plan to say that. But, uh, and if I sang it, it'd be weird, so I spoke it because it's cooler that way. Spoken words, it's in my spirit. Okay, all people are farmers. So you can't disqualify or you can't uh, opt out of the... Um, commission and the byproduct of being a human on this physical earth in a short timeline that you're here, you are sowing seeds and reaping harvests, okay? So you can't escape that fact. So now if we know that all things can be seeds and really are seeds if you look at it, because we can, well, I'll say this, all things are seeds, We don't have to sow all things, but they're all seeds. And if all people are farmers that sow and reap harvest no matter what, then the most important thing we recognize is, number one, 
uh, we need to make sure that we know what seeds we're sowing, right? And then we learn in this portion of Scripture that all things can be seeds, but we also learn that there are only two kinds of soil, right? Let us not grow where, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 8, for he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Here's your soil. Are you ready? Flesh and Spirit. So you can sow to the flesh in life, seeds in the flesh, and you'll reap corruption in the flesh. Or you can sow seeds spiritually, and you'll reap spiritual harvests in everlasting life. So last week we learned something, a statement that has hopefully stuck with you this week, and it's God gives us seed and not trees. Do you remember that? If you didn't hear the message last week, God gives us seed and not trees. So if you're praying for trees and complaining about seeds, then you're missing God's entire purpose for your life. Because we're going, God, I want apples, so I need an apple tree. And God gives you apple seeds, and you go, God, and you throw them on the ground and go, wait, no, Lord, you messed. I want apples, Lord, so I need an apple tree. And God goes, here's apple seed. So anything in life that God wants to do through your life, he is going to start small with seed and see engage your faithfulness with that small seed. And depending on how you handle the little small things will determine if you're qualified to handle large things or great harvest. Faithful with little, ruler over much. It doesn't mean tolerate the little until you get the much. It means to cultivate water and be faithful through faith and patience and appreciation and thankfulness, handle and steward what you have now, even if it seems not enough or not anything near what you're wanting or think you'll see in life, how you steward that will determine the big things that you can handle. This is something I constantly reiterate because it is part of the very foundation of operating in the kingdom. We are humans and worse Okay, I don't want to offend you. I didn't mean worse. We're humans, but even more of a challenge sometimes, we have Western mindsets, okay? And that means it's really easy. It's, it's easy to um, not appreciate the little things. You ever notice it's like uh, until you didn't have something, you really don't have a perspective of how thankful, appreciative, and valuable that is? I mean, how many of you got upset with the person in high school that had a family that had lots of money and their first car was like everyone's dream car. You know what I'm saying? Like, just be honest. You had an attitude when they drove up in a Mercedes and you had a Pinto or whatever you had, right? Uh, or Geo Metro for my generation, right? Geo, <laughs> Geo Metro. I'm, if you have a Geo Metro, I love, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm just saying, I, I was just saying that's probably not the dream, right? You know, at that time. So, we would get upset because we're like, now you don't, and, and it's interesting because they really didn't know how to steward or, or, or value that. You know, I, I remember one kid in school that he had the nicest, he had the truck, but it was every, it was like, he had this green truck that was like, I don't know, 60 inches off the ground. He had, and I don't, people don't do this as much anymore, but we really thought it was cool to have a lot of speakers in your car. I don't, I don't hear that as much anymore. And the more bass you had, the cooler you were. And then we'd cut holes. My neighbor actually had a, uh, a, a lowrider, and he would he get like a dancing car. You ever see him? And he had the hydraulics, and I used to go over there and hang out with him, work on his car with him all the time. And uh, he had Dayton's. If you don't know what Dayton's are, you're not gangster, right? And so, and, and he would, his car was on hydraulics, he'd make it dance, and he would cut holes out. He cut holes in the back seats and then perfectly placed speakers that came out of the, it's like a massage and a speaker all at once. And he had so much bass, and, and his amps were the big deal, you know, because that's where the power comes from. And you remember Fosgate? Some of y'all, I'm, these are my people right here. We're all the same age. That's why. Okay. But, and uh, I remember, like, I'd be inside. Oh, okay. There you, yeah. You know what's funny is that's not far off from my first car, actually. It's very close. Geo Metro. They don't make Geos anymore, do they? The shame, the shame. If you own one right now, afterwards we'll talk and I'll apologize and whatever. You know, I could go all day on that, actually. But my point to all this was, I don't know, actually. I don't know what I was saying. What was I saying? It was good and y'all got me. I know speakers, but what was the spiritual point? 
Yes, stewarding, yes, thank you, the, the spoiled kid. So we can be like that high school kid spiritually a lot. And we say we neglect what God's done or what we have. And, we, and as a parent, I understand it more now because there's nothing more frustrating to me or that can disqualify. I love my kids. I would die for my kids. But there's one thing that really just makes me not want to see their face or just be around them ever again. And it's whenever, and it's not my kids, it's all kids, really, when they have an attitude of disgust or a lack of appreciation for the things that they have, right? Have you ever seen a kid get a Christmas present and it wasn't the one that they thought they were getting or at the time? It's like America's Funny Song Videos does this a lot. I love that show, by the way. Another age thing right there. And, uh, and there'll be a whole thing of videos of the kids that throw a fit over the present. And every time I watch that, it's funny because um, I'm like the dad now that I used to see with my dad. He would get irritated watching that stuff. And now I'm, I'm just like, that kid, man, somebody, that kid needs correction right there. That's an attitude. And they didn't do any Those parents are going to have a lot on their hands if they don't take care of that now. But how many of us realize that we can do and many times do the same thing with God? And we're going, God, why haven't you dot, 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 whatever it is? And it might be the very thing that we are annoyed at is what God's saying, because you, dot, 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 haven't honored, valued, stewarded the little that I've given you. If you got that Geo Metro, then you need to clean it out, vacuum it, put wax on it, even if there's no coat, top coat anymore, wax, whatever, the rust. Because the way that you steward and value that is your, your proving, your maturity to be able to steward and value greater things. And that's so huge, okay? So we're all farmers. All things are seed. And we have flesh and spirit as soil. God gives us seeds and not trees because he uses small things to manifest big things. You want big things? God says, start with the small, and I'll use that to grow into big. Now go to Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to just focus here on the, the seed of the kingdom of God. Because the church has got to be more effective than it has been. I'll just let you get offended. We're not as effective as we should be. And a lot of times the way we try to be effective, it's not for lack of trying. It's probably for a lack of listening. And we're doing it our way instead of God's way. And so today I want you to see how the body of Christ, the church is meant to transform the world, the generation that we're in, and it's not what you think. It's not how big of a building or how many people can we fit in it meeting once a week. That's important. You need to be worshiping together. Don't neglect for assembling together. But beyond just services or a building, we are called to not just impact but transform this world and override the kingdom of darkness which is in control. You know that, right? Adam turned the world over to the kingdom of darkness. He had stewardship of the earth. And Adam and Eve sinned, gave the authority to Satan. The Bible even calls Satan the god of this world. If that wasn't in Scripture, you would think it was blasphemy. Yeah, how would you call the devil god? Well, he's the god of this world because this world is fallen and he's in authority over it. So if we want to turn this world from darkness to light... There's, there's a scriptural way to do it, and it's, can I just say this? It's not as hard as you think. I used to think in the old packaging, and there's nothing wrong with this, that street evangelism, because this comes out, especially is really big in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. It was like street evangelism is the only way to advance the gospel, and we were fired up about it, and that street evangelism is great. Don't get me wrong. It's, there, there's a place for every type of getting the gospel out. But it's not the only way or method to get the good news of the gospel to every tribe, nation, and tongue. Thank God for the internet, and we can now reach more people than we've ever been able to reach before. So there are different strategies, same mission, different methods. Okay, I hope you're ready. Verse 26, Mark 4, 26. Jesus is now describing to us and to the disciples what the kingdom of God looks like and how it can be understood. So Jesus is saying, you want to know about the kingdom of God, I'm going to give you the basic 
mental image so that you understand the entire packaging of the kingdom that I've come to bring. Jesus did not come to bring religion to the earth. He said, I've come to bring a kingdom, preaching the kingdom of God. And we've been saying Jesus came to bring religion, and he was a great religious leader, and now we have great religions, and there's no power in religion, right? There's power in relationship. We can talk about God, but do we know him? So verse 26, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is... Say is. Okay, here's the definition. As if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now he's given us a picture of how his kingdom works. So we have man, seed, farming, which means scattering or sowing seed on the ground. And should sleep night and day, uh, sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and he does not know how. So it's not the farmer's job to understand everything about how every you know, chemical reaction takes place. His job is to sow the seed and water the seed. He sleeps night and day. It sprouts, grows. He doesn't know how. Verse 28, for the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade. Say first the blade. Okay, it's important because this is now progression here. And this is something God has been reiterating to me because I don't like this portion. I would rather go, well, let's just read. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. And I would say, Lord, let's just, if it was my scripture, I would say first the blade, then the full grain in the head, right? But he says, no, there's a process here. He goes, the seed is sown. This is the kingdom now. Then night and day. So between sowing and the blade, there's night and day. And we don't know how many nights and days, depending on the seed, depending on the season, right? So you have sowing the seed, night and day, stewarding the seed, which means he has to continue to make sure he gets water. Then all of a sudden, in due season, the blade pops out of the ground. Then after that, the head is talking about corn, I think, right? No, grain. But I don't know what all these terms mean, the blade, the head. I didn't even look all that up. But you know what I'm saying. It's like the blade, and then there's the head of grain, and then I guess there's more grain in the head of grain. Y'all can study that later of how grain operates, right? But the point is the progression here, okay? So you can't go from blade season to full grain season, You have to go through then the head season, okay? You have to go through the season of growing into the harvest. It's so important to recognize that because subconsciously we assume that we can go from here to there. And there's some things you're going to hear soon that what God's doing in this ministry and some just doors he's opening because we're in a year of open doors that we're going to be growing through that progression and we're going to see each season flourish. We are in one season, but God told me we are now, we're always sowing, but we're coming out of only sowing season, and we're stepping into blade season. And even blade season comes with, then it grows to that second stage to where you're in between seed, but you're not just seed anymore, and you're not quite full harvest. You're in that multiplication season. And that's the most fun, let me tell you. Sowing, the Bible says you sow in tears, right? That's addition. You're like, okay, one seed, one seed. I only have 10 seeds, right? So now I have nine. Now I have eight. Now that's subtraction, multiplication. I mean, subtraction, addition, right? You're just counting seeds. And it's the reason you sow in tears is because it's also leaving your hand. You're like, and there goes that seed. Okay, I'm trusting you. Why? Because your faith is not based on what you see. Everything's going in sowing season. You're like, oh, I had something in my hand. Now it's not there. I had something in my hand. Have you ever felt that way? Okay. If you're sowing, that's the best possible thing that can happen. If Satan's stealing your seed, you need to make sure that's not the reason it's not in your hand anymore. There's two reasons. So, sowing season. We're going into that. So, Jesus tells us that, verse 29, when the grain ripens, so now we're at due season, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. All right, let's read this next definition of the kingdom, verse 30. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? So, now he's saying, how shall we picture it, he says. Verse 31, it's like a mustard seed. He keeps saying seed. Mustard seed, when it's sown in the ground, it's smaller than all the seeds on the earth, but when it's sown, it grows up, becomes greater than all the herbs, shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So he's saying here, you want to understand my kingdom? Seed. Sowing seed, time, harvest. Small seed, God uses small things to what? To reveal and produce Big things. So he's saying my kingdom starts that way. It starts by sowing the small things, 
and it will be impossible for the enemy to stop if you keep sowing kingdom seeds. It doesn't just grow up to a harvest. It becomes the greatest of all. And not only is it bigger, greater, higher, stronger than all, but it goes on to say that even it provides nourishment, shade, rest. It's like having a tree to where you are now not just uh, a source for yourself, but the kingdom grows to a harvest that it's now that seed a source for all who are in the vicinity. Wouldn't you like that to be the definition of your life? That I'm not just living to keep myself and my family alive and get what we need, me and my four no more, but now my life is a source of shade, of fruit, of peace for all those that are around me. You know you're operating in a blessed life when people get close to you and that blessing or that residue of God's grace on your life rubs off on them, right? Where this, the blessing is operating. We know that can happen because people that are in the curse can rub off on us too. And so if that can happen, then we can also have the opposite effect. I'm trying to keep it very slow because Revelation's going to slap your toupee off in a second. So we're going <laughs> to keep going here. Verse 32, it says, When it's sown, it goes and becomes greater than all the herbs, shoots out large branches that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Now, here's what I want you to see. We're talking about the kingdom here for a second. Let me just define a kingdom to you because we're talking about sowing the kingdom. The title is very strategic. I didn't say kingdom sowing as the title. The title is sowing the kingdom because Jesus says my kingdom seed let me give you another picture. Jesus says, my kingdom, mustard seed, sowing. So sowing the kingdom is important to understand as we go through this. A kingdom consists of the domain, which is land. So here's what a kingdom is made up of. This is a natural kingdom, God's kingdom, spiritual kingdom. Kingdom is the domain, the will, and the authority of a king. So anywhere you have the king's domain or land and where his will reigns supreme, and where his authority is the highest authority, then you have his kingdom. So you can't say this is part of his kingdom if you don't have all three. You can't just say, well, there's some, if a king owns some land, I mean, it's impossible to do this, but let's say he owns land, but he's not the highest authority then that's not an active part of his kingdom because he's not king over that land. The definition of king is highest authority. So you can't have a kingdom as a king if you're not highest authority. But you also have to be the owner of that land or that domain. And when you're the king, your will is what the constitution is, not a constitution. A real, I don't mean a modern-day kingdom because they're all mixed with democracies and different things. I'm talking about a biblical kingdom is very offensive to an American, if you really think about it, because it has nothing to do with fairness for you. If you have a good king, it's the greatest possible form of government, better than democracy, republics, any other type, uh, re or, uh, parliamentary representation, whatever, any type of government. Kingdom with a good king, righteous king, best. It's not up for debate. Kingdoms are the best form of government. The problem is people are messed up. So if there's a human king that is flawed and not Jesus, then it can be the worst form of government because the will of the king is law. So if the king says, I don't like your head, cut it off, cut his head off, it doesn't matter. That's, you can't do that. Well, I want to stand trial, not in a kingdom. The king doesn't like you, your head's coming off. King likes you, he can promote you, he can make you. I mean, what did Joseph became second? Pharaoh said, you're promoted. He didn't vote. He didn't say, well, I got to go through parliament or I got to Congress and see if they like you. I'll convince them to vote. Not like that. That's low power leadership. Kingdom leadership is the will of the king goes. So you have a kingdom. You have to have do his domain, his will, and his authority together. So in, or here we go. Revelation's coming. In order to establish the kingdom of God, you have to establish the domain, the will, and the authority of God somewhere. Jesus says, Here's how you do it. Seed. Here's how you get my kingdom to spread around the earth, to unseat the kingdom of darkness. Jesus did it spiritually, and then he said, here's the deal. Church, 
you're not. He said it is finished. That means he did his work. But now he passed the baton and said, now I finished the work. You reinforce what I finished all around the earth. So take this gospel of the kingdom into every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every corner of the earth, and now establish the kingdom of God where you go, where I send you. How do we do that? Matthew 13, 31. I'm going to read quickly here for sake of time. I want you to get this revelation. This is so rich. Matthew 13, 31 through 33. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man sowed in his field. Now I want you to say, he sowed in his field. Okay, the kingdom of heaven is seed that a man took and sowed in his field. Now you can interpret this a lot of ways, but I want you to apply it to your life. His means his or hers. So now, if you want to see kingdom, take the kingdom seed and you don't sow it into other fields. You start with your field. So that means, look, you want to change the world out there, change the world in the walls of your home first, right? Sow kingdom seed in your field, your marriage, your children, your business, your emotions, your mind, whatever it is, you have to sow kingdom seed. Then he goes on to say, verse 32, which is indeed the least of all seeds. We learned this earlier, but when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Verse 33, the parable of leaven here. Now, this is the fourth understanding here that we're getting, or the third that we've read today, but the the fourth total. And it says, another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Listen to this which a woman took and hid in, say in. Okay, do you take the seed, or you take seed and you sow it what? The soil, in the soil. Okay, now we're seeing a different example. Leaven, the woman took and hid it or put it in three measures of meal till all was leavened. Why? Because the leaven leavens the whole lump. It will grow and increase until it takes over everything. So it, he's saying, here's how my kingdom looks. Small leaven in a lump, you put it in the meal, and it will grow just like a mustard seed, and be, all of a sudden, the entire meal, all of the flour, everything is now leavened because it overtook it over time. So he's saying, my kingdom must be sown. Do you want to be obedient to the Great Commission? Then you have to know this, and it's, it's crazy how the more you read, the more you see this, and you're like, why don't we hear this enough? Jesus said, take this gospel of the kingdom to every nation. Guess what? That means take my kingdom, sow it as seed everywhere I send you. How, here's the question, do you sow the kingdom? If the kingdom seed, that's great. I get all the spiritual stuff. But like, how do I tomorrow morning activate and do what you're teaching right now? Here's, here's where we're going to get it. As we read in Mark 4, we're going to see something. Jesus is saying, I'm teaching you about the kingdom he gives all these examples about the kingdom, and then he now goes from just giving verbal examples of the kingdom, teaching about it, to manifesting the kingdom in front of them. So this is a, this is a field trip, if you will. This is like we're going to not just hear it in the classroom, but now I'm going to let you experience, and I'm going to show you the kingdom and how what I just taught you works. We know that because literally at the end of him preaching about the kingdom to them, let's go to verse 35, Mark 4, 35. You're going to see just this continue. Sorry, we were in Matthew, but we started in Mark 4, and we learned about the parable of the seed. Mark 4, 35 says, on the same day. Say, same day. Okay, so literally, I'm going to teach you all about the kingdom. He even said earlier in Mark 4, we didn't read it, he said he gave him the parable of the sower, and he said the sower sows the word, and he said if you don't understand this, you can't, how will you understand any parable? So he's saying this is the most important thing, and now the same day, he is now going to show us examples of the kingdom of God, of what he just taught us, and he shows three examples of how the kingdom is manifested. So he's going to show us how to sow kingdom seed and see kingdom results. 
Verse 35, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took along with him in the boat as he was, and the other little boats were with him. A great windstorm arose or a hurricane, and waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling with water. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose, rebuked the wind, rebuked the wind, rebuked the wind, and said, said, said to the sea, peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now, was the hurricane changed before Jesus said anything? He was in the boat, in the hurricane, nothing changed. It wasn't until he said, peace be still, and then all of God's kingdom backed what he said, the power of of God, the kingdom of God, and stopped a hurricane. In the Greek, it speaks of not just a, a windstorm, but a hurricane windstorm. I mean, high winds from releasing his word. So now we're about to see as we unfold these next few miracles Jesus does, he's doing them succession. He's showing what he just taught. What did we learn here? We learned that the kingdom of God, ready, is released or travels through his word. He says, you want to learn how to sow kingdom seeds? Number one, word, my word. My word, wherever my word goes, my kingdom goes with it and backs it. And so he's saying, look, here's how the kingdom looks, seed, seed, seed. And immediately they're like, man, that's good. They just finished taking notes. He goes, come here, let's go to the other side. Storm happens, Jesus in the boat, they're all freaking out and he comes out. And remember, they're experiencing this. We've heard it a million times. We just go, oh, I've heard that before. Think about the first time it ever happened, you're experiencing it. And, uh, and somebody speaks to a storm, never happened before, never seen it like that. And he said, peace be still. And all of a sudden, a hurricane immediately within a split second goes away, right? So now you're saying, he said peace, and it stopped. So we're seeing the authority of his word. Now let's keep reading here. We're gonna see another example. Verse, uh, chapter five, verse one. Then they came to the other side of the sea. Same continuation here. The country of the Gadarenes. And there, when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. This sounds like an intense horror movie right here. And it says, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying out and cutting himself. Can you imagine trying to go to sleep at night, and you hear a demon-possessed crazy man right above you in that hill that you live at the bottom of? cutting himself, screaming all night long in the darkness of the moonlight? I mean, this is intense, right? This is like a really scary situation. The people were terrorized who lived in this city by this man and these demons. Verse five, or verse six, when Jesus saw him from afar, he ran, excuse me, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Can I just tell you something? Jesus had not been revealed to the people yet as the son of the most high God. They all thought, man, this could be the Messiah. This is a great prophet. They didn't know really what was going on. They just saw miracles. This is the very beginning. And all of a sudden, a man possessed with thousands of demons reveals prematurely who they were walking with. They're like, did you hear what he said? Son of the most high God. I implore you by God that you don't torment me. Verse seven, think about this. Jesus just gets out of the boat and steps foot on that side of the water, of, on their territory or domain of the Gadarenes. As soon as a king from another domain stepped foot on their domain, not whenever he was in the boat looking at it, as soon as he came onto the land, now a king from a higher domain, higher kingdom, has now stepped foot on a lower kingdom or domain. And immediately the demons said, don't, please don't torment us. Jesus didn't say a word. So we saw previously, Jesus said, let me show you my kingdom. It is now revealed through the word and backs the word. Now Jesus is showing something different. He's saying now the kingdom he's revealing to them because now it's, it's show and tell. I told you about it, now I'm going to show you. Now it's revealed by his presence. Just the presence of the king 
totally disrupted and forced back the kingdom of darkness. So he's saying, you want to expand my kingdom, my word? Now he said, my presence. And you can go on to see here, and I'm for sake of time, I'm not going to read all this, but he says, uh, come out of this man. What is your name? They say, we're a legion for many. Legion, 6,000 Roman soldiers. There's 6,000 demons in one man. That's a lot. A lot of people just had one that he cast out. I mean, this guy's on another level of demon possession here. He cast out 6,000 demons, but what I want you to see is that they were tormented by his presence. The kingdom of darkness is tormented by the presence of Christ, the victor over the kingdom of darkness. So you want to operate in a high level of victory of the kingdom of darkness? Then you need to be operating in the presence of God. You need to know how to, how to move in the presence of God, recognize his presence, be aware of his presence, and activating his presence over your presence. Then the last one here in verse 25 in Mark chapter 5. Don't worry, I always end big. The revelation's coming. It says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd. Jesus wasn't aware. He was talking to people. They were pressing on him. He was trying to get somewhere. And it says, she said, if only I may touch his clothes, verse 28, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus knew that power had gone out from him, and he said, who touched my clothes? And we'll go on down, and she finally said, it was me, Lord. And he said, your faith, go, because your faith has made you whole. So we see the word revealing the kingdom, word seed. Then we see the seed of his presence that furthered his kingdom and took over territory or domain. And now we're seeing faith in his authority that reveals his kingdom. Jesus didn't have to speak to her to heal her. The Bible says, and he's God, and he, he's God and man. So I believe on when, when he was operating according to his physical brain, he was not aware of her there. He was busy doing other things because this is teaching us something. God wants us to see this. So it didn't have to do with his presence because everybody was around him. He's revealing his kingdom in three ways. His presence just pushed back the forces of darkness five seconds ago or however, right before this. Now all of a sudden, God is saying, now I'm going to shift how I reveal my kingdom. And now his presence is there and there's sick people everywhere touching him and not getting healed. He's talking to people and there's nothing happening. Why? Because God's showing us how his kingdom's revealed. Now, this woman just puts faith because she knows who he is and his authority. And as soon as her faith activates that authority that's already in him, she pulled it out of him and was completely made whole. And Jesus said, I felt power leave. I didn't send power out. She didn't ask permission. Well, there's revelation in that. She just, with her faith, demanded and pulled power out. Why? Because she's so, her faith in him was so rich and so accurate. Once you know who he is and your faith is in him alone, then you can't help but extract power out. God doesn't, he can be doing whatever he wants. It doesn't matter. Your faith in him is what activates and receives his power. So now we learn that his kingdom is revealed through his word. Then he shows them is revealed by his presence, and it's revealed through faith in his authority. So here's what the kingdom of God is. Here's some facts. Are you ready? Write this down. This is Revelation. God's kingdom travels through his word. So if his kingdom's to advance, you can't advance his kingdom without the gospel. The word of God is primary. So if anyone, Paul says, preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. So you can't advance the kingdom of God in your own words. Or in your own way. When his word goes forth, his kingdom moves with it and backs it. So, facts about the kingdom. It travels through his word. Ready? Number two, it establishes his authority. Because wherever his kingdom goes, now when the kingdom takes, just like the madman of Gadara, when he stepped on that land, what happened? Now his authority reigned in that place. Right? So now his kingdom took authority over that area, and that guy, those demons couldn't help but say, please don't torment us, send us into the swamp, what, just do whatever you need to do, but they were judged by his presence, right? So his kingdom establishes his authority, and number three, it manifests his will. Wherever the kingdom of God is in high authority, complete authority, then the will of God is evident. You ready for this? 
Is the kingdom of God highest authority in your life? You can work backwards from your harvest because you're a farmer, whether you like it or not, and you sow seed every day, whether you like it or not. It's either flesh or spirit seed. And if you're under the authority of God's kingdom, then you're going to be seeing harvest of the kingdom in your life. But if you're sowing flesh seed, then you're going... The Bible says he's not mocked whatsoever. It doesn't mean only some things. You will reap what you sow. So the most important thing is now being aware of our sowing and aware of what it does. So how do we sow the kingdom? I kind of gave it to you, but I'm going to make it more simple now. Number one, how do we sow the seed of the kingdom? We're sowing the kingdom here. Number one, sow his word. That word sow, you can also say to put in or to insert, right? So wherever his word is sown, right, his kingdom goes. And if you insert his word, let me say this. I say insert because I'm talking about circumstances now, not just a physical location. So if you want kingdom results in any circumstance of your life, we're learning how to get results. Because earlier I said the church didn't get results like it needs to because we got to do it God's way. You want kingdom results, then you have to insert the kingdom seed of his word into the circumstance that you want results or changed according to his kingdom. So instead of describing it with your words, complaining, doctor's words, bank's words, economy's words, giving weight and faith to every other word other than his, then you are not subjecting that to his kingdom. So as soon, let me, let me make it more simple. If you don't like the circumstance, check the word that you're sowing into it. And it's easy to stop because I do this. I'm not just pointing to you. I, do, I can complain. It's easy to complain. It's human nature thankfulness is hard. Have you noticed that? Like you have to really work that up. You ever know, I'm going to be thankful and you have to grit your teeth and have a little bit of attitude and force yourself, right? Complaining, it just comes right out of your mouth without you thinking about it. So here's the deal. If you, you need to stop, let's just say husband and wife, this is a covenant we can have right here. Hey, if we're sowing our words, Satan's words or any other word into this problem, let me know about it. We're going to stop. And now number one, how do you take his, sow his kingdom? We're going to now sow his word into this moment instead of ours. So you can freak out about what the doctor said, and that's facts. But like Chi quoted earlier, facts are changed by truth. So now we're going to sow his word. Wait, everybody stop saying the facts. I don't need to hear. I already know. I don't need you to say it in 80 different languages and 45 different ways from eight angles, the same negativity, right? You stop that and you say, I'm sowing the seed of his word kingdom word in this moment now. And then you have to know what the seed of his word is, and you only sow that. This is guaranteed. The Bible says, whatever you sow, you'll reap. So if you sow, and you don't realize that you've been sowing this whole time, worry and fear. So you're reaping that. You want a different result, say, I'm not going to speak that anymore. No, Isaiah 53, by his stripes, I was healed right? Now you're sowing the right seed. So you want to sow his kingdom. His kingdom's a seed to change the world with the kingdom of God. You have, number one, sow it or insert his word into the situation. Number two, sow his authority. Sow his authority. And I've got the stories out because it sounds better this way and this way my mind works, okay? So sow his authority. Now we're talking about the woman with the issue of blood. Faith in his authority. You can write it that way. Sow faith is an authority. So here's the deal. How do you sow his authority? You insert the authority of God into your situation, because if it's chaos, it's somewhere gotten out from under his authority. So we have to arrest it. It could be a marriage. It could be any circumstance. And you say, that's not the fruit of God. I mean, it's easy to recognize what the devil's doing. Now we're going to subject that and we're going to insert the authority of God into this moment. So if it's not in agreement with God, we're not going to say it. If God doesn't permit me to do it, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because this is now under the, his authority. I'm sowing the authority of God into this moment. And just as Jesus stepped out of the boat onto the land, or just as that woman, the issue of blood, got under his authority with her faith and touched him, now you're activating the power of God over anything to operate at a high level over the kingdom of darkness. If we want to transform our city and our nation, guess what? We have to, number one, we got to take the word and sow it into our city, into our nation. Number two, we have to insert the authority of God into our city. Who does that? Not the lost. Don't get mad if the lost aren't sowing the authority of God. Into their, they don't serve him. We, as the church, remember the church isn't getting it done right. What do we need to be doing? First of all, the gospel has to be primary going forth. 
Number two, we have to take with faith and subject everything under his authority. That means if you're his body, this is, this is deep right here, and it's under his authority, then guess what? It's under you. The Bible says that we're his body, his feet, and he is going to, until death, all things, is subjected under his feet. That means the church should be operating at a higher level of authority than the world. That means you can't just exist and wait till Jesus comes back. You're supposed to be dominating with authority wherever God has placed you. I don't mean physically forcing yourself. I'm talking about spiritually in authority over that place. So guess what? You don't like your job? You have to arrest the atmosphere there by faith in prayer and release your faith and say, this, I know my boss is demon possessed. This, this job is demon possessed and it's the wrong fruit and it's all over the kingdom of darkness. But I'm here just like Jesus stepped onto the land of the Gadarenes. And so now the devil goes, please don't torment us. Just send us into the pigs. That means we're, we know we're leaving. Just tell us where to go. Then you take authority. You need to go home today if it's fruit in your home is of the kingdom of darkness and you need to tell those demons where to go. You didn't know you visited a church like this today? Well, you did because I'm going to do it the way the Bible says. And you, if you're not being looked at as crazy, you're really not doing it right because everything Jesus did, people were like, what in the world is he doing? That's when you're operating on a higher level. So you want, if you want the same results, just don't ask for counseling, okay? Go home today. Now, now don't just go home and yell at your husband or your wife or whatever and say, I'm coming to those demons. No, not like that, okay? I'm saying the atmosphere. You need to say, as for me and my house, this house, we will serve the Lord. We are prioritizing the kingdom of God. His word is first place. We're not going to let our eyes close or our bodies slumber until his word has habitation in our life. That means every day his word will be released in this house. We are not going to speak the word of the enemy in this house. We're not going to describe the darkness of the enemy. We will speak his word, and he is in perfect authority over our lives in this house, this family, these kids, my body, my mouth, my thinking belong to him. Once it's under his authority, now it's his domain. A kingdom is the domain, the will, and the authority of a king. Once you're under the domain of the kingdom, guess what? All the results of other kingdoms disappear. This means everything changes. It's not that hard. So his word, so his authority, faith in his authority, and here's the third one, so his presence. Insert his presence. Now, what do I mean by that? We know that the Lord never leaves us or forsakes us. So it doesn't mean that you got to do something for Jesus to be with you. Ready? The awareness and the honor or recognition of his presence is what causes darkness to flee. If you're more aware of the presence of Christ in your life than the presence of any other thing or force, then you are now rejecting all of those and you're giving the throne to his presence in your heart. That means if you don't like what's happening around you, stop in the middle of it. Even if people think you're crazy and go, guys, I'm sorry, this is going the wrong direction and I don't want to deal with this in six months. Can we just, I, you can ignore me or go somewhere else. I got to take care of business real quick. In the name of Jesus, I'm sowing his word now. This belongs to you. This situation, God, is yours, Lord. I don't care. As soon as fear comes in, you got to stop right there and go, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to worry. Lord, this is yours. These kids, this bill, Lord, this house, this car, this spouse, this job, whatever, Lord, is under your authority. Your word reigns supreme in this moment, Lord. And I recognize your presence in this place. And where there is light, darkness can't coexist. And so now, whenever you sow his presence, you're sowing light into that situation because God is light and in him there is no darkness. You're in darkness and you don't like it, shine light. Why are we lights, church? Because our job is not to go out and act like good Christians. Our job is to go out and be the light that God has called us to be and shine where there is darkness and it can't coexist. So number one, you sow his word and it doesn't mean just say, Lord, I'm sowing your word. No, you have to say it right? So you got to know, and it might take you. You might have to stop right there in the middle of that chaos and go, hang on a sec. I got to find. You might have to get you one of those Bibles that has like subjects in the back where it's like healing, attitude, kids, you know, money, whatever. And you got to go to that section and there's going to be all the scriptures and you're like, I'm going to read it right here. I'm sowing because I'm a farmer. Because here's the deal. If you're not saying his word, you're saying something. So you can curse the situation and whatever you sow, you'll reap. 
So this might sound extreme, or pastor's getting, he's splitting hairs now. This is, is this new age, what's going on here? Just the Bible, right? The kingdom of seed. Now, God is under your authority. That means if it's under his authority and you're stewarding it, that it in a wrong way, you have to change how you're stewarding it or it's not under his authority, right? So it's all default here. You can't say, Lord, it's under your authority, but you still do what you want. Now you change it. And then number three, you're going, now I recognize his presence. We do this every night before our boys go to sleep, praying with him. Father, I thank you that you're with us, Lord. Lord, I thank you that your word is true. We are always acknowledging and honoring his presence everywhere we go. Because here's, here's the point I want to give you at the end. It's 1130, last point. What you don't occupy will be occupied. Amen. What you don't occupy will be occupied. You, you can't, it's not a, well, it's, it's like I didn't do anything, so no. The Bible says, and I'm not going to read it because I had it in my notes, but I'll just give you Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Jesus is talking about when an unclean spirit goes out of somebody. He's teaching about this situation now. He's saying when an unclean spirit leaves and he's kicked out of a, of a heart, he's talking about of a person, right? And he said it's swept. The area is clean and swept and all put in order. But here's what happens. It says he comes back with seven of his friends, seven other spirits, and he finds the, the place clean and swept but not occupied. And that's his permission to come back and occupy it. And now it's not just him, but it's him and seven other spirits. So here's the deal. If you don't, so is presence, if you don't occupy, if you don't charge the, the just atmosphere of your home or your life or your car or your brain, whatever, with the presence of God, then the enemy will gladly occupy that empty space with his presence and his will. So it's offensive, not defensive. You can't wait until it falls apart. If everything's going great, that's even more the time to sow his word, more the time to make sure everything's subject to his authority and to recognize his presence. When you get in your car and go to work, don't just listen to talk radio or Kiss FM or K104, I don't know what y'all listen to now, or you know, iPods or whatever, even good podcasts, right? Those are great. But before you do anything else, you need to sow into that moment right there. I, I think every time you walk into a new building, you should sow a seed of his word. That sounds extreme, Pastor. Well, whatever you sow, you'll reap. And I don't know about you, but my brain is on default, messed up, crazy, Right? We have fallen age. We have to constantly renew our minds. So if you're not speaking his word, your mind's going to talk for you. And it's crazy because I'm preaching this, and this week I'm, I'm, I'm literally studying this, and my, I'm, my mouth is speaking, and my brain's going, what happened? It had nothing to do with what can't. Why? Because out of your heart, your mouth speaks. And so if you're not constantly keeping your heart in the right place, then it's just going to start going, I just never happens, and God, why anymore? And that's dumb, and I don't believe that anymore. You have to do that. Now, I could be overdoing it, but guess what? Um, I'm not, okay, because the Bible says I'm not. So I want you to stand up with me, and we're going to practice that this week. If the kingdom is a seed, I'm going to leave this with you. If a kingdom is a seed, the kingdom of God is a seed, then if you want kingdom harvest, here's what you have to do. You have to keep sowing the seed of God's kingdom. It's, it's constant, faith and patience. Consistency over intensity. I preached a whole series about that. Intensity doesn't cut it. I, I grew up in a, uh, well, I came uh, out of a ministry in a church, and, and not, a, not the specific church, but I mean like a part of the body of Christ, I've been to different parts of the body of Christ. I mean, I've been to Baptist churches and Methodist churches, and I mean, I've, I've seen it all. But, but there's, a, there's a charismatic side of the body of Christ that does a lot of things right, a lot of things good. But also, we can be really intense. But God is not impressed with your intensity. He's impressed with your consistency. Because the Bible says you're scattering seed. You're not throwing a seed out real hard and going, woohoo, and dancing around that one seed. And you're like, man, I got a miracle seed, amen. And you don't sow anymore. Consistency is I'm going to keep watering it. I'm going to keep sowing. I'm going to keep sowing. You want to see a total transformation in this church, in your life, in your business, in your home, whatever it is, then you sow seed, kingdom seed. You keep sowing kingdom seed. You keep sowing kingdom seed. And the Bible says it's like a mustard seed. Eventually, it becomes greater than all. That means any other kingdom in your life is stomped out by the kingdom of God's harvest in your life. And now it's not just greater, but then everything God's kingdom tree provides, you have access to. Now you have nourishment and shade and rest and peace and joy and righteousness. And all of these things are under the umbrella of the tree of God's kingdom. 
You want all that? Keep sowing his kingdom everywhere that you go. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that we are not called to be a church, Lord, that just uh, you just does it like everybody else, or we just play church, or whatever it is. Lord, in this season, Lord, you have reignited me and activated me. Lord, let our faith be stirred up, Father, that we're not called to just be in this earth, Lord. We are called to transform this earth, this generation, with your gospel, with your kingdom, Lord. And I pray that every person that's a part of this body, Lord, would be activated where you place them, and that they would, Lord, no longer tolerate the fruit of darkness in their life or anywhere around them. Their neighborhoods, Lord, if things are happening in their neighborhoods or their part of town or their city, Lord, that are not in agreement with your kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy, then, Lord, I pray that they would not be able to sleep because they'll be so convicted that they're the ones that can release the authority and the seed of your kingdom that will produce transformation and harvest that changes the world and that we would all look up and say every knee will bow, every tongue will confess as you split the sky open that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Father, I thank you that this is the generation you've chosen, Lord. Lord, I thank you that we would not be compromised or lukewarm in this season, Lord. I pray that you would just ignite our faith, not to be trying to do something for you, Lord, but let it be a natural byproduct of our love and our passion for you. And Lord, I thank you that you will show us and reveal to us the ground that we're standing on and the sprouts that are coming up around us so that any seed that has been sown that is not of you. I thank you that your grace overrides all things, Lord. And so, Lord, we rest in your grace, Father. Your blood can totally eradicate sin in our entire past. And I thank you that your blood is not just about the past. It changes the future too, Lord. So whatever seeds that have been sown in our ignorance or where we didn't understand, Lord, I thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, Lord. And you're worthy of all praise. Let this be the most effective year we've ever had. And we trust you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen.